who are you? Really, who are you? And how does that identity play a significant role in the trust God has placed in you to live in these amazing latter days? Let's talk more about these questions and some other significant truths that will help you overcome discouragement and darkness and protect your family from the slippery slopes of sin. Hi everyone, this is Ben Peterson and welcome to the Hope in Christ podcast. This is a weekly conversation that follows the Come Follow Me curriculum of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. In these conversations, we dive deep into the scriptures and words of modern prophets to build our hope and faith in Jesus Christ and help him prepare the earth for his second coming. I'm so glad that you're listening today and really hope that you enjoy our episode. Hi, it's great to be back with you again to discuss some things that will complement your own personal scripture study. If this is your first time with us, welcome. As always, I hope that as we connect the scripture chapters in this week's Come Follow Me study with current teachings from the Lord's prophets, I hope you're able to actively seek personal revelation through the gift of the Holy Ghost. That revelation is going to do far more for you than anything you hear spoken during our conversation. But hopefully, our discussion will invite that spirit and revelation. This week's study is the Lord's Word found in Abraham chapters 1 and 2 and Genesis chapters 12 through 17. But I'm going to start off today by sharing with you a little bit about the childhood of someone that I love. Perhaps you can relate to parts of this story or know someone else who can. As a little girl, she grew up in a family that was not religious, but she'd gone to a few different churches from time to time with her grandmother. The many different houses, apartments, and motel rooms that this young lady's family periodically called their home were dark places, often filled by her father and her stepfather with violence, immorality, all kinds of abuse, and the constant presence of drugs and alcohol. Naturally, As a sweet young girl living in such a storm of vice and vulgarity, she never felt safe even in her own home. Though she retains a few good memories of her childhood, most of it is overshadowed by memories of being hurt or feeling alone. Moving or being evicted from one home or motel room to another, her teenage years were spent sleeping each night on the floor of a bedroom closet. And because most of her family's income was spent on drugs and alcohol, they often had no access to basic utilities such as gas, electricity, and water, sometimes leaving this sweet teenage girl nowhere to shower aside from stopping down the road at the water spigot at the edge of the parking lot of the corner gas station for a cold, humiliating rinse. Without mentioning the other, far more bone-chilling details of what this bright young woman was forced to call every day of her childhood, which would surely put a pit in your stomach and bring a wellspring of tears to your eyes, she describes her younger years as very dark and something understandably difficult to think about. Yet deep inside, this strong young woman always felt a nagging feeling that there was more to life than what she was forced to experience, that there was something out there, somewhere, that was missing from her life that she was supposed to experience, something that would bring great joy to her. When she was 14 years old, she was invited by a friend to attend a church activity with some other girls her age. She agreed to go and almost immediately realized that the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and the gospel that the church embraced was the very thing that she knew was missing from her life. Before she could even meet the missionaries, she was asking to be baptized. After joining the church and eventually starting her own life away from the gloomy memories of her past, she no doubt wondered from time to time why she had to experience such unpleasant and even atrocious episodes in mortality. Perhaps you can relate. Maybe some of you still experience some PTSD from horrifying experiences you've faced during your life. If you or someone you know has had to experience dark or unfair circumstances because of the poor choices of other people, you will relate to the prophet Abraham. We often talk about Abraham by referring to his being asked by the Lord to be willing to sacrifice his son Isaac, 
No doubt that story most certainly shows Abraham's faithfulness to put God very first in all things, but that's not the only part of what makes Abraham so wonderful and truly faithful. Even in his younger years, Abraham faced some of the most difficult times. As we turn to the book of Abraham, remember these words are, as the prophet Joseph Smith said, the writings of Abraham. Though it's possible that they were Abraham's writings that had been passed down through the generations until they ended up on the scrolls obtained by Joseph Smith and other early church members in Kirtland, they are the words of Abraham. Abraham was a descendant of Noah's son Shem. Shem and his posterity inhabited the land around Israel and the Arab nations. Shem's name is where we get the word Semitic, relating to the Hebrew, Arab, and Aramaic cultures. Abraham grew up in a place called Ur of the Chaldeans. His book starts by saying, In the land of the Chaldeans, at the residence of my fathers, I, Abraham, saw that it was needful for me to obtain another place of residence. Now that's Abraham's calm way of saying, I needed to run for my life because his parents' home had become a dangerous and evil place. The next few verses are really important, but we'll come back to these few verses in a couple of minutes. First, we're going to work our way backward through Abraham chapter 1 to paint a more accurate picture of what Abraham experienced as a young man and what a good and faithful young man he was, even though he grew up in some very dark circumstances. You might remember from our study last week that one of Noah's other sons named Ham apparently tried to steal the priestly robes passed down from from Adam to Noah, and that he and his posterity sought to unrighteously imitate the ancient sacred rituals of God's priesthood without God's authority. They did this as they tried to build the Tower of Babel, an imitation of the Lord's temple. And one of Ham's daughters settled the land of Egypt, where they established a government of kings they called pharaohs. Because they had lost priesthood authority and no longer followed the teachings of the Lord and kept the covenants that were given to their fathers, Ham's posterity eventually created their own gods to worship as they tried to imitate the rituals of God's priesthood. And they even claimed to have received the priesthood through Ham, but because of Ham's wickedness, he had lost his priesthood authority, leaving his posterity now outside of God's covenant. Abraham and his father didn't live in Egypt. They lived in Ur. But as evil always does, the influence of the Egyptians' attempts to imitate God's priesthood had spread into the land of Ur, located hundreds of miles away. And Abraham's father, Terah, was influenced by the wickedness of the Egyptians. Abraham said that their hearts were set to do evil and were completely turned to false Egyptian gods. Their obsession to worship these made-up gods even led them to sacrifice the lives of their own children. And Abraham eventually found himself laying on one of their sacrificial altars with an evil and false priest and others lifting up their hands to take away his life. But just like the young woman's story that we started off with today, the Lord did not forget Abraham. In fact, the Lord was watching closely over Abraham, just as he was with that young woman. Even though others sought to sacrifice the lives of these innocent youth in favor of their own selfish desires, the Lord provided a way for both this young woman and Abraham to eventually escape the evil that seemed to choke out their childhood. And the Lord's words to Abraham are the same promise he gave to that faithful young girl. He told Abraham, Behold, I will lead thee by my hand, and I will take thee to put upon thee my name, even the priesthood, and my power shall be over thee. Why? Why would the Lord step into the lives of these two young people, Abraham and our stalwart young woman? Well, that's where the story gets so good. Do you remember the young woman's story? Through even the darkest moments of her younger years, she knew in her heart that something was missing. She had even received strong and clear impressions that there was something more out there for her, something that would bring more happiness and help her heal, help her feel safe and complete and whole. 
Now, let's look at Abraham chapter 1, verses 2, 3, and 4, as Abraham describes his similar experience. As we read this verse, pay close attention to the action words Abraham uses to describe his experience. And finding there was greater happiness and peace and rest for me, I sought for the blessings of the fathers, and the right whereunto I should be ordained to administer the same, having been myself a follower of righteousness, desiring also to be one who possessed great knowledge, and to be a greater follower of righteousness, and to possess a greater knowledge, and to be a father of many nations, a prince of peace, and desiring to receive instructions, and to keep the commandments of God, I became a rightful heir, a high priest, holding the right belonging to the fathers. It was conferred upon me from the fathers. It came down from the fathers, from the beginning of time, yea, even from the beginning or before the foundation of the earth down to the present time, even the right of the firstborn or the first man who is Adam or first father through the fathers unto me. I sought for mine appointment unto the priesthood according to the appointment of God unto the fathers concerning the seed. That's the end of his words. Sometimes I wonder if we sometimes think that we're not good enough or righteous enough or important enough to get some of the miracles that other more faithful or amazing people might get. That's simply not true. The worth of every soul is great in the sight of God. He cares as much about you or I as he does about his most most faithful prophets. He longs to be able to give to every one of us the fullness of his glory. And as long as we're seeking and asking and desiring, God will eventually reveal and answer and bestow. Abraham used the word desire a few times in those verses. Because the Lord will eventually always bless us with whatever it is that we consistently show him that we want, we should be comforted if the desires of our hearts are pure, even if we struggle on a daily basis to realize those desires. Remember, the Lord has said, I, the Lord, will judge all men according to their works, according to the desire of their hearts. Elder Neil A. Maxwell taught, Desire denotes a real longing or craving. What we insistently desire over time is what we will eventually become and what we will receive in eternity. Close quote. That's because what we insistently desire will eventually affect what we seek out. What we seek after will affect what we do and the choices that we make. And consistent choices have a direct effect on who we become. And of course, who we become whether it is the epitome of the natural man or woman, or a repentant sinner changed and made pure through the atonement of Jesus Christ, that will ultimately determine what we can and will receive in eternity. In a sense, we all live in a world much like Abraham's home. Perhaps with the exception of the occasional sibling argument, our homes are somewhat of sanctuaries of peace and love. But once we step out the front door each morning, or even open certain apps on our phones or turn on the television, we enter a world that is filled with idol worship, a world that desires to sacrifice you and your agency to false gods, sins, or addictions. So to use Abraham's words, what are the desires of your heart? What is it that you truly want now and when this mortal life is over? What are you seeking out, even hour by hour? Do you spend more time seeking some form of recreation than you do revelation? Are you finding yourself more often seeking to hear or see something in a news or social media feed or a video streaming app than you do seeking to see or be the Lord's hands or hear His voice? What are you already doing to seek out righteous desires? And how can you build and increase those righteous desires? In a recent General Conference talk, President Russell M. Nelson taught, The huge project to renovate the Salt Lake Temple continues. From my office, I have a front row seat to watch the work taking place on the Temple Plaza. As I have watched workers dig out old tree roots, plumbing, wiring, and a leaky fountain, I have thought about the need for each of us to remove with the Savior's help 
the old debris in our lives. The gospel of Jesus Christ is a gospel of repentance. Because of the Savior's atonement, His gospel provides an invitation to keep changing, growing, and becoming more pure. It is a gospel of hope, of healing, and of progress. Thus, the gospel is a message of joy. Our spirits rejoice with every small step forward that we take. Close quote. President Joseph Fielding Smith taught, We all know something of the courage it takes for one to stand in opposition to united custom and general belief. None of us likes to be ridiculed. Few are able to withstand popular opinion even when they know it is wrong, and it is difficult to comprehend the magnificent courage displayed by Abraham in his profound obedience to Jehovah in the midst of his surroundings. His moral courage, his implicit faith in God, his boldness in raising his voice in opposition to the prevailing wickedness is almost beyond comparison. Close quote. So, no matter who we are, and no matter our background or the privilege or lack of privilege we were born into in this world, every one of us is loved by God. And He is giving each of us a full opportunity to embrace His gospel and find His path to a better life, even eternal life. You might remember a few weeks ago, we studied Abraham chapter 3, where Abraham was shown in vision the premortal life where he learned that he and many others were prepared and foreordained to be leaders in God's kingdom on the earth and receive the fullness of his gospel and his glory. That was a vision that didn't come to Abraham without first seeking to know and understand the Lord's will for him. And it is the same for the young woman in our story earlier, and the same for each one of us. As that young woman continued faithful, making and keeping sacred covenants with the Lord, she was eventually blessed with an understanding of her exceeding premortal faithfulness, having been sent to a very specific family here on earth with a very specific purpose that would help fulfill the Lord's promises to Abraham which leads us perfectly into the next part of our conversation. Let's start this part off with a question. What defines you? Really, when you think about what defines who you are, what do you think of? In our first Old Testament episode this year, we talked about Moses and how one of the first things God did with Moses on the mountain was to teach him that his true identity was that he was a son of God, created to be like his only begotten son. That's definitely the essence of who each of us is, but let's explore it a bit more. In order to understand more about you and what truly defines you, we need to understand first a little bit more about Abraham. And before we can understand what we need to about Abraham, we need to be reminded about what a covenant is. A covenant in the religious context is a sacred promise with God. God fixes the terms of the covenant. Each of us can choose for ourselves if we will accept the terms of God's covenant and obey God's law. If we will, we receive the blessings associated with that covenant. Obedience to covenants with God allows us to receive the greater demonstrations of God's love, demonstrations that are impossible to give to individuals who reject God's laws, thus making them incapable of receiving specific blessings. God had made covenants with His children in every part of His plan of salvation and exaltation. For example, covenants were entered into in the premortal life, wherein God promised to send a Savior for us here in mortality. In the scriptures, we read about people who were identified as the children of the covenant. We also use that term today when we talk of being born in the covenant. Well, what covenant are we talking about? We're referring to the covenant the Lord made with Adam and Eve, with Noah, Enoch, and their wives. And it is a covenant he also made with Abraham and his wife Sarah. It is God's everlasting covenant to one day bless His children with everything He has. Everything. Specifically, the Lord mentions to Abraham as part of that covenant the promise that Jesus Christ would be born through Abraham's lineage, 
that Abraham's posterity would be numerous, entitled to an internal increase, and also entitled to bear the holy priesthood of God. It also included the promise that Abraham would become a father of many nations, that certain lands would be inherited by his posterity, that all the nations of the earth would be blessed by his seed, and that it would be an everlasting covenant, even through a thousand generations. What we call the Abrahamic covenant is the covenant that was also made with the prophets and other righteous people, including the people of the city of Enoch who preceded Abraham. The Lord has chosen to call the covenant after the name of Abraham, just as he's chosen to call his priesthood after the name of the righteous prophet Melchizedek, who ordained Abraham to the priesthood. You see, the book of Genesis is just setting the stage for the rest of the scriptures. Here is a spoiler alert. This next overview I'm about to give kind of gives away a bit of the rest of the Old Testament story. From Abraham, the story will continue as God makes this same Abrahamic covenant with Abraham's son Isaac, and then again with Isaac's son Jacob, whose name will be changed to Israel. Jacob's sons and their posterity will continue as God's covenant people and will be known as the tribes of Israel. Even though this covenant family had access to God's priesthood authority and the blessings of the gospel, eventually they rebelled, killing the prophets. They were punished by the Lord and scattered throughout the earth. But in his wisdom, the Lord used that form of punishment to Israel to help further his work and keep his promise to their righteous fathers, including Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Even Old Testament prophets like Isaiah saw the scattering of Israel and God's promise to eventually gather them back again. You see, even part of the scattering of Israel, this punishment to Israel, was meant as part of God's all-knowing plan to help spread the gospel to the entire earth. During the Savior's own mortal ministry, he established his church again, including apostles, prophets, seventies, teachers, and others. And he sent his disciples into the world to share his gospel. But soon, the Lord's church fell into spiritual decay. The people changed some of his teachings and the sacred ordinances of the priesthood. And just like others, like Ham, who chose to follow their own ways, They also lost the priesthood authority, though many, also just like Ham, would falsely claim God's authority. Paul and others knew that this time of great apostasy would come, and it would happen before the Savior's second coming. Every time when the Lord's gospel had been dispensed to his children, and we call those time periods dispensations, and every one of those dispensations of the gospel had ended the same way. After Adam, Enoch, Noah, Abraham, Moses, Jesus Christ, and others, every time the people would turn their backs to the Lord and would selfishly seek to live life however they wanted to, giving little to no heed to God's prophets or God's word. And every one of those dispensations were limited in time and space. They were limited in time because they ended in apostasy. And each of the dispensations were also limited to a relatively small space or location on the earth. When we look back to the time of Christ's crucifixion, some of the promises made to Abraham had already been fulfilled, but some had not. Remember, the Book of Mormon prophet Nephi said, Wherefore our father hath not spoken of our seed alone, but also of all the house of Israel, pointing to the covenant which should be fulfilled in the latter days, which covenant the Lord made to our father Abraham, saying, In thy seed shall all the kindreds of the earth be blessed. President Russell M. Nelson has taught, Isn't that amazing? Some 600 years before Jesus was born in Bethlehem, prophets knew that the Abrahamic covenant would be finally fulfilled only in the latter days. Thus, a complete restoration was required. God, the Father, and Jesus Christ called upon the prophet Joseph Smith to be the prophet of this dispensation. All divine powers of previous dispensations were to be restored through him. 
this dispensation of the fullness of times would not be limited in time or in location. It would not end in apostasy, and it would fill the world. Close quote. The Lord said to Joseph Smith, Abraham received promises concerning his seed and of the fruit of his loins, from whose loins ye are, my servant Joseph. This promise is yours also, because ye are of Abraham. That's in Doctrine and Covenants 132, verses 30 and 31. Elder Bruce R. McConkie explained, The greatest and most important talent or capacity that any of the spirit children of the Father could gain is the talent of spirituality. Most of those who gained this talent were chosen before they were born to come to earth as members of the house of Israel. They were foreordained to receive the blessings that the Lord promised to Abraham and to his seed in all their generations. This foreordination is an election, close quote. And President Russell M. Nelson has assured us, some of us are the literal seed of Abraham. Others are gathered into his family by adoption. The Lord makes no distinction. Together, we receive these promised blessings if we seek the Lord and obey his commandments. But if we don't, we lose the blessings of the covenant. To assist us, his church provides patriarchal blessings to give each recipient a vision for his or her future, as well as a connection with the past, even a declaration of lineage back to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Close quote. As recipients of this everlasting covenant that has been restored in this last dispensation as the new and everlasting covenant, Ours is the responsibility to help fulfill the Abrahamic covenant. President Nelson said, Ours is the seed foreordained and prepared to bless all the people of the world. That is why priesthood duty includes missionary work. After some 4,000 years of anticipation and preparation, this is the appointed day when the gospel is to be taken to the kindreds of the earth. This is the time of the promised gathering of Israel. And we get to participate. Isn't that exciting? The Lord is counting on us and our sons, and he's profoundly grateful for our daughters who serve as missionaries in this great time of the gathering of Israel. Children of the covenant have the right to receive his doctrine and to know the plan of salvation. They claim it by making covenants of sacred significance. Brigham Young said, All Latter-day Saints enter the new and everlasting covenant when they enter this church. They enter the new and everlasting covenant to sustain the kingdom of God. They keep the covenant by obedience to his commandments. At baptism, we covenant to serve the Lord and keep his commandment. When we partake of the sacrament, we renew that covenant and declare our willingness to take upon ourselves the name of Jesus Christ. Thereby, we're adopted as his sons and daughters and are known as brothers and sisters. He is the father of our new life. Ultimately, in the holy temple, we may become joint heirs to the blessings of an eternal family, as once promised to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and their posterity. Thus, celestial marriage is the covenant of exaltation. That's the end of that quote. Another quote by President Nelson says this, As prophesied by Peter and Paul, all things were to be restored in this dispensation. Therefore, there must come as part of that restoration the long-awaited gathering of scattered Israel. It is a necessary prelude to the second coming of the Lord. Close quote. And if you want references to any of these quotes, they're all included in the transcript that's available in the episode description. Elder David A. Bednar once shared, you may enjoy music, athletics, or be mechanically inclined, and someday you may work in a trade or profession or in the arts. As important as such activities and occupations can be, they do not define who we are. First and foremost, we are spiritual beings. We are sons and daughters of God and the seed of Abraham. Close quote. Let's go through just a quick scenario, just a hypothetical one. 
Let's say the world has been exposed to a fatal disease and everyone will soon die without a particular medicine. You and your family alone not only have the needed anecdote, but you also have enough of it to cure everyone who is sick. What would you want your family to do with that medicine? What might you say to a family member who felt too busy or nervous to help distribute the medicine? How might our need to assist others in this situation be like our need and responsibility as the seed of Abraham? Elder David A. Bednar has said, Truly great responsibility rests upon the seed of Abraham in these latter days. We are here upon the earth at this time to magnify the priesthood and to preach the gospel. That is who we are, and that is why we are here. Close quote. Knowing that we are the ones the Lord has reserved and now sent to earth to bless all the nations of the earth with his gospel, I love this recent counsel from Young Women General President Sister Bonnie H. Corden. The best way for you to improve the world is to prepare the world for Christ by inviting all to follow him. That's from her talk, Come Unto Christ and Don't Come Alone, from the latest General Conference. Elder David Abednar also taught before becoming an apostle, and listen to this, I love these words, we were foreordained in the premortal existence to the blessings associated with birth through a particular lineage, even the chosen lineage of Abraham, not because we're better, not because we're more special, but because we have particular responsibilities that we covenanted we would fulfill. Therefore, we came to earth through a lineage with the birthright blessing of the priesthood. Every man who holds the priesthood was foreordained to that very responsibility in the premortal existence. Does a young man who understands that doctrine have a choice to go on a mission? He made that choice before he was ever born. I'll interject that quote for just a second. I would add that that young man gets to choose here now whether or not he'll remain faithful to that previous decision that he made or whether he'll go after his own way. Elder Bednar continued, We come to the earth as the seed of Abraham to participate in blessing the families of the earth. Father Abraham was given the promise that through him and through his posterity, which is us, All the families of the earth would be blessed. How? By our bearing this ministry, which is the responsibility to proclaim the gospel and this priesthood, meaning the saving ordinances of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We have promised that we will carry this message to the nations of the earth. Brothers and sisters, you and I were born to spend our lives proclaiming the gospel and serving others. Might I suggest that if you are 65, retired, and thinking about serving a mission, you made that choice before you were ever born. It is through the lineage of Abraham that we came to the earth. Blessing others by proclaiming the gospel is what we were born to do. Close quote. Those are powerful words. Nephi saw this remarkable time, and he saw you and I in a vision, coming and going in the latter days, working to fulfill the great covenant of gathering Israel back again before the Lord's glorious descent to the earth. Nephi said, And it came to pass that I beheld the church of the Lamb of God in the latter days, and its numbers were few. The saints of God were also upon all the face of the earth, and their dominions were small. And it came to pass that I, Nephi, beheld the power of the Lamb of God, that it descended upon the saints of the church of the Lamb, and upon the covenant people of the Lord, who were scattered upon all the face of the earth. And they were armed with righteousness and with the power of God in great glory." That comes from 1 Nephi chapter 14, verses 12 and 14. God walks with us in this work. 
We are before him. He knows us, no matter our backgrounds or talents. Before giving Abram and Sarai their new names of Abraham and Sarah, which mean father of a multitude and princess, the Lord told Abraham that he was to be perfect. But the sense of perfect the Lord refers to here is a command for us to become complete or whole, not flawless. Something that can only happen as we receive more and more the influence of the Holy Ghost and its accompanying powers to become like God. And that happens only through priesthood ordinances and because of the atoning sacrifice of the Savior Jesus Christ. Remember that God's people are given immense promises of eternal blessings that we cannot even begin to imagine or even understand. But with those promises, we are called upon to fill the earth with the word and the glory of the Lord. And when you think about it, it is interesting to realize where the Lord placed his people upon the earth. He promised Abraham that his people would eventually inherit the land of Israel. Jerusalem, at the heart of Israel, has been called the navel or center of the earth, with the Lord's ancient temple being the centerpiece of Jerusalem. Remember, the navel or belly button is where an unborn child receives its nourishment from the mother. So God's covenant people were placed at the navel of the earth, sent to nourish and give life to the earth by spreading and teaching the word of God, his priesthood, and his glory throughout the entire world. But we're to influence the world without losing our way in the many confusing paths presented to us by a confused global society. The thought of receiving God's light and then going out into the world to bring others to receive his light for themselves actually reminds me of an experience I had recently. Several months ago at work, I was working with the talented team who was charged with creating the church's annual youth theme video for 2022, which was just released, by the way, in the last week or two. The team wanted to try something new and portray an interpretive dance that could teach a message about the theme, Trust in the Lord. As you can see for yourself on the church website as you watch the video, the final video portrays a young woman who feels for herself the warmth and love of God's light. Knowing what it has done for her after having experienced herself moments of darkness, She wants to bring others to the light, to help them experience for themselves a fuller representation of God's love and joy. As we discussed ideas about how to effectively communicate the message through this video in dance, through the wardrobe, through lighting and other effects, we had discussions about how elements of the light in the video could follow this young woman, the main character, throughout her journey to gather others in. That light that she carries with her into the world would be something that lives inside of her and would help keep her safe as she lives in the world and works to gather Heavenly Father's children in without losing her own way in that world filled with doubt, distraction, and deception. As Abraham continued his journeyings through the land surrounding the promised land that would eventually be given to his posterity, and not only in Old Old Testament times would it be given to his posterity, but also when this earth becomes the celestial kingdom and the dwelling place of all who are faithful recipients of God's everlasting covenant. As Abraham continued faithfully, he journeyed around that area with his brother's son named Lot. At one point, Lot and Abraham separated because of some conflicts. Abraham allowed Lot to choose first which land he wanted to live in. And Lot chose to dwell in the plains of Jordan with his tent pitched toward the wicked land of Sodom. A few months ago, in General Conference, Elder Quentin L. Cook shared a message about finding personal peace in challenging times, our times. He said, In my lifetime, I have never seen a greater lack of civility. We are bombarded with angry, contentious language and provocative, devastating actions that destroy peace and tranquility. Peace in the world is not promised or assured until the second coming of Jesus Christ. Universal peace was not part of the Savior's initial mortal ministry. Universal peace does not exist today. 
However, personal peace can be achieved despite the anger, contention, and division that blight and corrupt our world today. It has never been more important to seek personal peace. Close quote. As one way we can seek personal peace, Elder Cook urged us all to seek the fruits of the Spirit rather than the spoils of the world. He added, One of the great lessons in the Old Testament period relates to Father Abraham. Abraham and Lot, his nephew, were wealthy but found they could not dwell together. To eliminate strife, Abraham allowed Lot to choose the land he wanted. Lot chose the plain of Jordan, which was both well-watered and beautiful. Abraham took the less fertile plain of Mamre. The scriptures read that Abraham then pitched his tent and built an altar unto the Lord. Lot, on the other hand, pitched his tent toward Sodom. To have peaceful relationships, the lesson is clear. We should be willing to compromise and eliminate strife with respect to matters that do not involve righteousness. I'll repeat that last part. To have peaceful relationships, the lesson is clear. We should be willing to compromise and eliminate strife with respect to matters that do not involve righteousness. As King Benjamin taught, ye will not have a mind to injure one another, but to live peaceably. But on conduct relating to righteousness and doctrinal imperatives, we need to remain firm and steadfast. If we want to have the peace which is the reward of the works of righteousness, we will not pitch our tents toward the world. We will pitch our tents toward the temple. Close quote. So when you think about Lot pitching his tent toward Sodom, how dangerous do you think Lot thought it might be to pitch his tent near the city of Sodom? He wasn't planning on being in the city, and he didn't necessarily plan to participate in their wicked and sinful lifestyle. Do you think he even hinted a tinge of danger? Part of our study this week introduces us to the righteous king and prophet Melchizedek. The prophet Joseph Smith's inspired translation of the Bible, as well as scriptures in the Book of Mormon and Doctrine and Covenants, teach us more about the prophet Melchizedek than is currently included in the Old Testament. Through the prophet Joseph Smith, we know that Melchizedek was an exceedingly faithful man who wielded the power of God to work righteousness in his day. He was ordained a high priest after the order of the covenant which God made with Enoch, it being after the order of the Son of God. Melchizedek, whose name means, My King is Righteousness, was a foreshadowing of the Savior. He brought forth bread and wine and blessed them, a foreshadowing of the later ordinance of the sacrament. Aside from Abraham and his family members, Melchizedek is the only other mortal mentioned in this part of the Old Testament who worshipped the true God. But the Joseph Smith translation of Genesis 14, as well as the Book of Mormon, do mention that there were many others in the land overseen by Melchizedek who were so righteous that just as Enoch and his city of Zion, Melchizedek and his city were also taken up to live in heaven until the second coming of Jesus Christ thousands of years in the future. Like Methuselah and his family, Abraham seems to have perhaps been left on the earth to create a posterity and a people that would continue to spread the work of the Lord through the generations, to fulfill his ancient covenants, and to roll out his plan that would eventually provide exaltation for all who would choose to receive it. Melchizedek was the king of Salem which was a city located on or near the sacred site of the later city called Jerusalem. The word Salem, or the Hebrew Shalom, means peace. Melchizedek was the king of peace, much like Jesus Christ was the prince of peace. And his city, named Peace, or Salem, would eventually become the later city known as Jerusalem, or the New Peace. Going back to our discussion about Lot, it's interesting to contrast him with Melchizedek. Lot chose to dwell in the plains of Jordan, which were lush, but the Jordan Rift Valley around the Dead Sea where Lot chose to live is literally the lowest spot on the earth. 
Melchizedek and his family, on the other hand, chose to live up in the highest part of the land in that area, in the city of peace, where they enjoyed the greatest blessings of the Lord that were available to his children on the earth, no doubt with an ancient temple in their midst. While Lot and his wife and children were subjected to the lowest kind of life in Sodom, being exposed to the violence and immorality and perversions of that worldly city. In fact, Lot's choice to pitch his tent toward Sodom eventually led him to being taken captive, and even after being rescued by Abraham, Lot's daughters later committed gross immorality. And where do you think they learned that kind of behavior? Most likely because of where and how their parents chose to live and what they chose to prioritize and allow into their lives. Is there even a small interest or habit in your own life that might be found in the lower plains of Jordan rather than in the city on a hill? What sins or temptations or potentially dangerous trends is the adversary trying to get you to think are not too serious? Is there any part of your life that might be even slightly pitched toward the worldly. Sometimes the hardest part isn't repenting and turning back toward the Savior. Sometimes the hardest part can be realizing what parts of our lives that don't seem dangerous are in reality causing us to teeter on the edge of a hill, allowing us to eventually slide right down toward Sodom without even realizing that we'd even left Salem. In this slippery world, one of the great blessings we can seek is to be able to discern what parts of our lives eventually lead us to sin and then stay away from them and throw them out. President Henry B. Eyring taught it this way, The truth is that we all need repentance. If we are capable of reason and past the age of eight, we all need the cleansing that comes through applying the full effects of the atonement of Jesus Christ. When that is clear, we cannot be tricked into delay by the subtle question, have I crossed the line of serious sin, or can I put off even thinking about repentance? The question that really matters is this, how can I learn to sense even the beginning of sin and so repent early? Close quote. And I would add one more reminder from President Russell M. Nelson, and remember this was said in 2018. In coming days, it will not be possible to survive spiritually without the guiding, directing, comforting, and constant influence of the Holy Ghost. Close quote. So true. And that's the spirit that's going to help us discern the parts of our life that need just a little correction. After rescuing Lot and his family from captivity, Abraham was still without children of his own. His wife, Sarah, couldn't have children. Yet they'd been promised eternal posterity, including posterity in mortality. Jesus Christ was to be born through their lineage, remember. And so were the latter-day Israelites, who would, in sacred temples around the world, bless all the families of the earth by sealing them together through the generations and with priesthood authority. To fulfill his promises to Abraham, God commanded that Abraham take Hagar, Sarah's handmaid, as a second wife. As a partial fulfillment of God's promise to Abraham that he would be the father of many nations, Hagar bore a son named Ishmael, who would in fact become the father of multitudes. Also in fulfillment of his promise, God blessed Abraham and Sarah, his first wife, with a miraculous pregnancy. Their son's name would be Isaac, and as the son from Abraham's first wife, he would bear the birthright and would be the father of Israel, both ancient Israel and the Latter-day Saints. And that leads us right into our study for next week. Our discussion today has included some very important responsibilities that we carry as members of Jesus Christ's restored church in the latter days. But so what? Is it enough to simply talk about what God expects us to do? The answer to that question can sometimes be not necessarily, but usually it's just plain no. Here's our teaching tip for the week. When you teach either in a classroom setting or at home, in fact, especially at home, teach for understanding. Teach in such a way that you're not just talking about good truth, but teach 
so that your children or whomever you're teaching can come to understand the why behind what you're teaching. When we can understand the why behind the commandment or behind the principle, it can light within us a fire to do things we wouldn't otherwise be motivated to do. For example, I don't know a young man who really, truly understands what it means to be of the seed of Abraham, who would then desire to go out and break the law of chastity. I don't know a ward mission leader or elders quorum president who truly understands the doctrine of the priesthood and the treasure that is the gospel of Jesus Christ, who doesn't jump at the idea of tirelessly putting in the effort to inspire an entire quorum or ward to actively minister and to share the gospel and love of Christ with every single person living in the boundaries of their ward, member of the church or not. No, we're not perfect. And no, it's not always going to come easy or without temptation and distraction. And Satan will make certain of that fact. But when we understand the foundational truths about who we are and what it means to have a physical body or a testimony of Christ or what it means to know that Christ willingly took upon himself every single one of our sins, what that means in magnitude of infinite love to say nothing of the infinite suffering. When we can come to understand truths like these and so many others contained in the gospel message, when we can truly understand them and understand them not just in our minds, but in our hearts, feeling the power of the Holy Ghost testifying to us of the reality, we gain perspective. We begin to see things differently. And with that wider and more focused vision, it changes our desires. And as we learned today, changed desires lead to changed choices, resulting in a changed person, changed, converted, complete, made whole, helping us accomplish Heavenly Father's will to bring us to a measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ where he can finally give to us all he has, because we'll finally have become capable of receiving it. As we're moving through these foundational parts of the Old Testament, I hope you're getting a real sense of how the Lord has worked even since before the earth's creation to preserve a righteous people that would be able to receive his supernal gift of eternal life. Along the way, he's made significant promises to righteous men and women and prophets, even since the days of Adam, and they've all looked to our day. And Joseph Smith even said that they all longed to be a part of our day. I hope you sense how special this day is and how significant the gathering of Israel is to fulfilling the covenant of the Lord and preparing for the magnificent return of Jesus Christ to the earth. And I share my own witness with you that he is coming. Just thinking of how lucky we are to be a part of this work as imperfect and ordinary people, as sinners trying to become saints, it overwhelms me with excitement whenever I take time to really feel the power and importance of living as disciples of Jesus Christ in these last days. God bless you in your scripture study this week, and God bless you in your daily efforts to be his disciples and help him fulfill his new and everlasting covenant in these latter days. I really hope you enjoyed today's conversation. Thanks for listening in and for taking the time to subscribe and send this episode to people you love. If you can, don't forget to rate this podcast and take a few seconds to leave a review for other listeners. If you'd like, you can connect with me on Instagram at Peterson. Until our next episode, remember there is always hope in Christ.